विक्रम हाँ ते म्यूट करना सा करता है ना अपने लोकना पार्टिसिपेंट दोज आर नॉट स्पीकिंग प्लीज कीप युअर माइक म्यूट सर जे को होस्ट है गुड इवनिंग ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आई पी नवी मुंबई एंड एम जे मेडिकल कॉलेज नवी मुंबई आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर दिस वेनेसडे एकेडमिक फीस्ट बाय नवी मुंबई आई आई पी फ्रेंड्स यू ऑल एग्री विथ मी दैट majority of the times in our opd major junk of the practice is first is vaccination nowadays followed by the respiratory complaints now respiratory complaints can be varied from just simple cough cold to breathlessness now this topic is of interest to pick up those cases those who require opd care those who require uh, observation and those who require hospitalization may be in a indoor facility may be in a icu setup and how to approach to the correct diagnosis so this today's webinar we arranged taking the collect, uh, collection of the various cases uh, those who have uh, come real uh, life cases uh, gathered uh, by our uh, guest speaker today and uh, he will uh, take us to various cases so that our approach to the diagnosis and uh, offering the best possible management will become easy today's session will be moderated by our very own dynamic uh, ip uh, navi mumbai secretary dr satish sane sir uh, dr satish sane sir uh, doesn't require any introduction sir is very active in uh, all ip activities and uh, is uh, one of the best intensivist around uh, i request dr satish to start the session and introduce the speaker thank you sir thank you very much no, uh, one more thing is one more thing before you start uh today's uh, speaker is my very good friend uh, parmarth sadne kadun uh, parmarth sadne ha ek aajcha uh, main uddesh ahe <laughs> parmarth sadne ahe barobar ani tyacha knowledge pan ghena mahatvach ahe ata okay uh, thank you jitu sir i think jitu sir is like a, what you call it as the carrying the mashal and we are all following that it's very been like a, like almost like 5 years now we are together and uh, is very wonderful to work with him not with uh, no mumbai feel like a one family now so good evening friends today's academic session is dedicated to the pulmonology which is i would say kind of uh, our second bread and butter first as sir has already told about the vaccination in pediatrics but the what we day, see day to day practice and there are so many dilemmas and uh, in many cases we are into stuck there are many few two pulmonologists around in the area so always there is a like something we have to uh, take a stance to clear out doubts and to clear out the doubts there is nothing like less than uh, i would say kind of uh, is a uh, one of the stalwart in uh, pulmonology and uh, i i would say in wadia is grace with two param params so in our days it was a parmanand and uh, we all like five five years sir was like around and sir has got the warrior to the very high level and now it's parmarth where he is taking to wadia to a new heights so it's very good to see the people dedicate uh, so much their i would say time and the uh, this one to bring the institute at the high level and dr parmanth is one of them uh, he has dr parmanth is a uh associate professor of pediatrics head of pediatric respiratory division, division by jera bhai wadia hospital for children parel mumbai and he specialize in flexible flexible bronchoscopy this is very important one of the tool to carry out a diagnostic and therapeutic procedure both in pulmonology also very specialize in ild cystic fibrosis and definitely it would is like what we see tuberculosis he has many publications i am very glad to share his slide here because we feel he is one of us and he is taking the 
Vadia Institute very high level. So I request Dr. Parma to start his session. Can you see the slide? Uh, uh, slides are a little It's looking large. Parat, stop share kun parat share kara. Haan, it's coming now. Re, re, haan, reshare. Yes, yes, full screen now. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jitendra sir, because uh, we were together for one uh, session and then he had, that time has spoken to me about taking one session for uh, pediatricians of Novi Mumbai and all over Maharashtra, those who all can join something interesting in pediatric pulmonology and that almost like uh, 20, 25 days back, I had committed to him that I'll definitely take. And also I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Shahane sir and Dr. Vikram Patra and uh, all office bearers of Novi Mumbai for giving me this platform to share some of the work which uh, you know, we started doing uh, around nine years back and we are continuing to do. And uh, you know, uh, every day has been a challenging in the pediatric pulmonology because when I started this pediatric pulmonology with Amdeka sir in nine years back, frankly speaking, I was not uh, very uh, uh, keen. I, I will continue with Vadia because I was more of a private practice oriented person. Uh, but you know, every day has been challenging, and we have seen new new cases. And it, you know, I have still been stuck in Vadia, and it is very difficult. I cannot take Vadia out of my uh, thought every day, and every day is like uh, Vadia and me. So going to the cases now. Uh, so these are the cases I have put around three cases uh, with some discussion after that. Uh, if all, all of you have any questions in between, also you can ask me. And I have kept few questions, uh, few slide blank for questions also, like you know any heads on this particular case after uh, giving some uh, info about that particular case. And then uh, uh, we will discuss approach to that particular case because as I said, every case is different and not all cases will have similar presentations, okay? So we are going to discuss mainly the approach towards such cases rather than dis discussing the diagnosis in that particular case. So coming to our first case. So this is a case one, this is from the NICU and uh, uh, this is a baby who is transferred to us on day 25 of life. It's a baby of Sheetal, 25 days old, uh, full-term newborn, gestational age of 39 weeks, 3.2 kilos weight and uh, uh, a baby boy and this child is having persistent tachypnea since day one of life and intermittent bluish discoloration of limbs and lips since day three of life. So, uh, born to a 39 year old mother, she is G4, P2, A1 and L2 mother. Uh, previous to uh, girls, they are almost like 17 and 15 years. And after that, there was a gap of almost like 15 years uh, so then the mother conceived spontaneously. There was an abortion in between. This child is referred to Vadia from Gujarat. And uh, antenatally, there was nothing significant. Mother didn't have any fever, rash, or anything significant. She has followed uh, ANC clinics regularly, and there was nothing in the ultrasound and anomaly scan and all. Uh, Triple H was also negative, and video results was non reactive. So it was a 39 weeker cephalic presentation. Liquor was clear. Mode of delivery is normal vaginal delivery. Baby cried well. 3.2 kilo was the birth weight. And uh, the baby did not require any resuscitation uh, there. So immediately after the postnatal, like after the delivery, the baby was handed over to the parents and the child was started on breastfeeding. The mother noticed on day one that the child is having fast breathing. And around day three of life, the baby was brought to the hospital with fever and then the child was developing bluish discoloration of limbs and lips. And the child was admitted there in NICU in Kutch in Gujarat. Uh, so day three of the life, the child was tachypneic, having fever, the saturation there documented was 55% on room air and saturation by O2 prongs was 68%. There the X-ray was done, which was a bilateral diffuse haziness 
and counts were 11000 and nothing of that significant crp was positive that was 77 so the child as usually all of us will do that it was started on o2 uh, and then was started on iv antibiotics and uh, on day 7 the fever was there for just for a day after that the fever subsided but the child was having persistent respiratory distress so the ch- they thought probably there is an underlying pulmonary hypertension maybe there is an associated uh, cardiac uh, condition also so they got an ecodan which was suggestive of some mild pphn and some right ventricular dysfunction inotropes and furosemide was started in the child uh that was continued for almost like next 15 days but the child was still having persistent respiratory distress so eco yes dr parman yeah hello uh, so uh, just as a discussion i just wanted to uh, ask one question mm-hmm. on day 3 when we the normal pediatrician or normal neurologist see so yes. what are the thoughts we can like discuss about absolutely so day yeah. three, the child has been brought to us like by the parents uh, this child was discharged on day 2 of life brought again on day 3 because the child developed fever and tachypnea so most of the times what we think is fever maybe it is dehydration related fever okay okay next thing is if the child is having respiratory distress which generally is not a part of your dehydration fever okay so we hear the fever and respiratory distress commonly we think probable there is a possibility of some Uh, early sepsis which can be yeah. presentation of uh, you know early sepsis or there can be a possibility of a, either a, a, what do you call it as a pneumonia can be there yeah congenital pneumonia will be the first choice to think about absolutely so we can yeah. thought, we can think of um, uh, because it is term child you should not develop respiratory distress syndrome as such unless an alter is diabetic or something like that absolutely absolutely no what is not going in fever of so fever this of this this uh, scenario i think congenital pneumonia will be the first uh, thing to thought and second is as uh, everybody is suggesting cyanotic heart disease where because the saturation is quite low of o2 so what is not going in favor of a mm. typical congenital pneumonia or a typical pneumonia mm. is how many times we see a saturation of 55% yeah yeah that's uh, in a pneumonia and the saturation not improving on o2 and o2. going only up to 68% so that is what is here is a clinch that a child has come to us on day 3 with a so much of low saturation and not improving on oxygen supplementation so here maybe one should be started thinking are we really dealing with the typical pneumonia here how commonly we see it is respiratory or non respiratory kind of a thing yes absolutely so we need to see here whether this child is having underlying cardiac illness whether this child is having underlying some form of respiratory disease or respiratory illness which may not be typically pneumonia but something else yes okay so here the story again will continue so on day 18 the child was having persistent respiratory distress so there they had done a ct which was reported as normal the child was started on steroids and then referred to wadi on day 25 of life so so in summary outside hospital initially the child was thought to be septic there was a component of pphn on almost like day 11 and uh, day up to day 15 that sepsis part pphn part got settled what was persisting is the tachypnea and the requirement of oxygen that was there and the child was persistently requiring oxygen that is the reason the child was transferred probably there is an underlying some lung involvement is there which is probably not a typical of a pneumonia or sepsis related so there is something else beyond the typical or there may be because they had done an echo there twice and there was no so the thoughts are basically non non respiratory like congenital cardiac or there is something which is causing like uh, maybe kind of a oxygen dissociation basically because he is not able to take the ox- oxygen or is not able to distribute the oxygen but the echo that was done there was not typically picking of any you know uh, any typical a synoptic heart diseases yeah so some questions are there so yes. what is the covid status of the mother in this case yeah so this was a covid negative mother covid negative child okay so the, in that hospital where this your child was admitted there the covid was not done we lack of hang up to one there meeting over covid status was done on day 25 when the child was transferred to us that it was negative but prior to that raise kar dega mera hand ye dekh dekh chal but prior to that there was no uh, what do you call covid status that was done for the child
Shall we proceed? Sane, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So the COVID status was done on day 25 in Wadia. That was negative for both mother and child. And antibodies also that were negative for both mother and uh, for the child, not for the mother. For the child, the antibodies, COVID antibodies also were done. That was negative on day 20. So then, how to approach such newborn where a child is persistently tachypneic, requiring oxygen supplementation, a full-term child where the oxygenation requirement has not gone not gone down with the age. Okay? And we have ruled out most of the part of the sepsis as well as underlying cardiac condition. Okay, So predominantly we are focusing here on a respiratory condition which is requiring oxygen for such a long time. Now, if this would have been a preterm child, would have understood probably there is an evolving BPD or the child is probably going into a BPD. But this is a full-term child. So why this child should be requiring oxygen for so long time? Okay. On admission to Wadia Hospital, the uh, vitals were stable, except the respiratory rate was 66. There was subcostal and intercostal interaction. CRT was normal. Peripheral pulses were well felt. Saturation on O2 by prongs was 96%. Okay. Saturation on O2 by prongs was 96%. This was almost like on day 5 of steroids. Day 5 of the steroids, when the child was transferred, the saturation was 96%. But after a few days, like after 3-4 days, on admission, the, the weight was 3.4 kilos and rest of the parameters were normal. System examination was also grossly normal. There was nothing significant. Chest was absolutely clear. Nothing was there on auscultation. And there was no murmur also. This was, these are the basic investigations done that were, that were done on the time of admission. Hemoglobin of 15, uh, counts were 15,600, platelets were normal. Then CRP and procalcitonin, both were normal. Electrolytes were normal. The ABG was showing pH of 7.46 with a PO2 of 49.4. PO2 of 49.4. ECO was also relatively normal. There was a small PDA with a left to right shunt. This was the X-ray that was done there uh, in outside hospital. And this is the X-ray that is done in Wadia. So as you can see, any comments on the X-ray from the pediatricians? Anyone can uh, mention on the chat box also? Second X-ray shows hyperinflation. Second, Second X-ray first... shows hyperinflation. This one, right? Yes. Yeah. Any other comments? How commonly we will pass this X-ray as a normal X-ray? In fact, I would have passed this the first X-ray as a normal X-ray if I would not have been given a History in background. Okay, Only the this... hyperinflation is uh, quite significant oh, in the first X ray also. Yes, sir, the first uh, the first X ray you are saying. Okay. Yeah, because uh, there is an underlying heart uh, air shadows. You want to say here, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But both the sides it is hyperinflated, you want to say? Yes, yes. Okay. So what I would say the first X ray I would have definitely passed is as a normal X ray. Okay, if I would not have been given a you know the history in background, the second X-ray, as uh, Sadawarthi sir said, looks like more an hyperinflated on the right side. But why it is looking hyperinflated on the right side? I feel it is more of a rotated film. If you see this X-ray, this part of the chest appears to be more closer to the plate as compared to the, this part, yes. and probably it's a differential exposure of the lung fields rather than an hyperinflation because if you see. The diaphragms are almost at the same site and the intercostal spaces are also not typically widened. They are not more than that as compared to the left side. Okay, so I feel it is more of a differential exposure rather than a typical hyperinflation. What I felt more obvious in this X-ray where there are some sticky hazinesses which were not, uh, you know, maybe you can say that this may be a retrospective evaluation. I understand that. But there was some retros. Uh, the, there were some sticky hazinesses bilateral there were and some small small areas of what you can say an rds like picture of an x ray that you can say not very typical but this is a retrospective analysis of the x rays probably in the first side when i saw this x ray i said ki uh, the first x ray i said ki it is normal the next x ray i said this is a differential exposure right looks more hyperinflated than the left but what i felt was on the more than the that i felt there was some sticky hazinesses bilaterally here, there were no advantageous sounds and the chest, the, the breath sounds were equally heard on the both sides. 
Okay, this is a CT which was done outside, was refer, reported as normal by radiologist there. This is done outside. What I felt here in this CT was, is the CT really normal? Okay. If you see these areas, okay, they are, there is a bilateral symmetrical involvement. And if you see this area, there is something called as a subplural translucent area. Yes, you can see, yes. As if like something, uh, someone has applied, uh, uh, someone has put a black line or something. Mm -hmm. okay. And if you see these lung shadows, these appear typically something like a, uh, some part is like having a ground glass opacities like here, maybe, and some parts are having some like diffuse white hazinesses bilaterally similar. So after seeing this CT, it was reported as normal by a radiologist. So uh, I felt this may be the changes what uh, what are seen here. I was not very sure. This is the CT which is repeated after coming to Wadia. Here again, I saw there are some ground glass opacities bilaterally which were there, but not very typical. Then this child was started on NIV support as a child after uh, three, four days, again, started requiring increased oxygen uh, requirements. Then orogastric fits were there, antibiotics were uh, uh, started PIPTAS and uh, amikacin were given and uh, the child was continued on oral prednisolone which was started outside. So in a nutshell, this is a 25 day old full term 3.2 kilos baby, cried well, no antenatal or perinatal issues, respiratory distress since birth, oxygen dependency since birth, mild pulmonary hypertension which was there and there was some query ground glass opacities on CT that was noted but not uh, reported by the radiologist. That's what I feel. What was a very, uh, um, I'm not sure whether to call it as not, there was a significant gap between the third and the fourth pregnancy. Okay, the first child is around 15, 17 years. The second child was 15 years. And there was a gap, huge gap of almost like uh, uh, 15, 13 years between the third, second and the, the, the recently born child. The first two were girls and this is a boy. So I was thinking whether there is an underlying uh, what we call a natural way of preventing an abnormal birth or probably there is an, uh, two girls are normal and this is a boy, probably there is something which is having a genetic inheritance, maybe something like an X-link, something which we was not sure, but this is what I noted during my history. Okay. So differential diagnosis, which we had kept, any differential clues here, any thoughts? Participants? Any, any any thought process, anything that you can think, we, how should we progress from here now? Congenital cystic malformations can uh, can present like this in a different uh, way. Uh, can present like this, but they would have been picked up on X-ray or CT. It, it is very yeah, difficult yeah. for uh, uh, the CT or X-ray to miss out on a uh, CPAM or CCAM, what we call. Yeah. So that, that should be definitely picked up. Which is not there. So, Hemant, doctor, uh, Hemant sir, Hemant Bhaiti sir has mentioned eventration of diaphragm. Eventration of diaphragm, uh, um, eventration of diaphragm is, as we have said, in fact, the what uh, Sir Samit sir was saying that some inflation, hyperinflation. So there was no eventration was there that was noted in this. One of the differential commonly what we see in this era is COVID. So whether it is COVID. Absolutely. So one thing that that should come to our mind: we are we dealing with a COVID child. Or we are dealing with something like a uh, child who is developed post-COVID complications. Okay, one thing is that before going to COVID, can this be something uh, viral infective etiology, something like a CMV? Can we keep that thing in our mind? Whether many times CMVs can present like this, but again, as I said, this uniform affection of lungs seen on a CT is not going in favor of any infection because infections generally have patchy involvement. Infection generally have patchy involvement. Patchy involvement. Somewhere mm -hmm. it will be atelectasis, somewhere it will be hyperinflation, somewhere it will be, you know, uh, mucus plugging, something of that sort should be some. Here, mm -hmm. what we are saying is a typically bilaterally symmetrical lung affection on the CT. Yeah. This pneumocystis carina also can present like this, but in later, later, later. Uh, so, pneumocystis carina, we, how commonly we do we see in neonates? It is very difficult. It's yeah, not that very, cool. very common, not seen. Okay, so second possibility, I feel, uh, I feel maybe there is some underlying uh, dysplasia or, or something like uh, some malformations of the airways or some uh, uh, maybe something on the last one, I thought maybe we are dealing with something like an interstitial lung disease, you know. Yeah, interstitial. 
हाइपोवेंटिलेशन but the child's uh, you know behavior yeah, and everything hypoventilation uh, peripheral only respiratory hypoventilation syndrome single gene yeah. not central hypoventilation i mean both can be there but this child may be respiratory hypoventilation syndrome so what is happening with this child is you know so this child we had kept that thought in mind about baby muscle involvement or something which is probably causing but this child saturation whether awake whether sleeping that was the same saturation the child was not tolerating oxygen withdrawal okay so and that amount of effort that generally we see that the child normally puts in a child with a respiratory because of muscle involvement was not typically seen with this child you know we we see many times coming with my, some congenital myopathies which are coming around 3 4 weeks of gestation and the amount of respiratory efforts that hypophonia or euphonia that that is associated with that was not there that there in this child so uh, that was thought that was thought was kept little down so i thought initially maybe we were dealing with something like a cmv which was or maybe some airway anomaly asthma dysplasia or i say alveolar capillary dysplasia which are commonly presenting in newborns what was not featuring uh, what was not very typical of acd what we call it as asinar capillary dysplasia is or alveolar capillary dysplasia is generally acds have unilateral involvement right more than the left okay so here in ct which was not not favoring acd but bilateral acds uh, are seen but they are very critical and they die almost on day 2 day 3 of life okay and the last but not the least we are kept in differential of an interstitial lung disease so we investigated in this child as per our differentials and first thing that we did in the child was a bronchoscopy okay so here we thought colony pulmonary infection something like a cmv what were the points in favor of this cmv were persistent respiratory distress what were not in favor of cmv or some other pulmonary infections were negative septic spin there was no sigma stigmata of intrauterine infection and the cultures were bulk cultures were also negative consistently even the blood cultures were also negative airway anomalies again were ruled out by doing a bronchoscopy which was not there then last we thought probably we are dealing in a child who has got a persistent respiratory distress with lung parenchyma involvement again there was a discrepancy between the thought process of a radiologist and thought process of our department was their thought was this is a normal ct and our thought was this is not a normal ct there is something maybe a granular opacity is very very fine something like a powdery opacity that are seen in the lungs and that was the that was the uh maybe it's the ct finding which i thought and we i thought let's proceed with a lung biopsy in this child and we did a lung biopsy in this child and the lung biopsy was fruitful for us this child lung biopsy this was a light microscopy which was showing alveoli exhibiting eosinophilic material which was like because almost all the alveoli were filled with proteinaceous material and there was some component of interstitial pneumonitis as well okay and then uh this child's lung biopsy was again sent for a electron microscopy electron microscopy showed focal alveolar simplification interstitial thickening with type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia there was some pulmonary alveolar proteinosis and lamellar bodies were not seen normally we should see lamellar bodies in this child lamellar bodies were not seen and all of these were favoring a diagnosis of surfactant deficiency okay, so persistent oxygen requirement in this child and then we had planned for sending a clinical exam in this child further management the child was started on prednisolone azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine the child was shifted from ni2 to cpap and finally we had discharged this child a week back on a portable cpap on prednisolone hydroxychloroquine and other azithromycin the clinical exam was awaited and the clinical exam also came and the clinical exam was suggestive of abca3 deficient mutation which was uh, the diagnosis of surfactant metabolism dysfunction 3 which was autosomal recessive and then this child is still following okay but now this child is on oxygen support and uh, 
this child we are planning for putting on a transplant list any in role of surfactant therapy in this uh, no sir so what we commonly see surfactant problems in newborns is one is surfactant deficiency and the other problem that we see is surfactant dysfunction okay so in preterm so we see surfactant deficiency so, so there the surfactant is basically replaced we or the surfactant is formed but the surfactant is not getting removed or the surfactant is formed and it is ill formed okay so there is a dysfunction of the surfactant there is surfactant either it is not correctly formed or whether it is not getting cleared up and getting accumulated in the alveolus so this child is typically a case of where the surfactant is getting formed but not getting removed and that's why we see so much of proteinaceous material in the histopad that we are seeing okay so the final diagnosis in this child was abca to mutation related uh, surfactant dis, uh, dysfunction syndrome any questions here on the first case Nehal, do you want to comment about this genetic thing? No, no, the workup is complete. Surfactant deficiency. I mean, this is a rare presentation, but as because they have done lung biopsy, uh, it was very clear diagnosis. So surfactant deficiency. Uh, only thing is, uh, why uh, any any uh, 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 why only uh, hypoxia? I mean, uh, there were no other uh, manifestations. You said no, only uh, plain simple hypoxia in this child. Plain simple hypoxia. Yes, ma'am. Which, which is usually not seen. I mean, maybe this this uh, is a little uh, different type of surfactant deficiency. But in your experience, any other uh, symptoms you have observed in the such patients with surfactant deficiency? I'm not talking about premature, but otherwise. Uh, so, madam, till now we have almost diagnosed 13 surfactant uh, dysfunctions, and the earliest we have diagnosed was this case was at around. Uh, this child is now bigger. But when you diagnose this child, it was around uh, maybe one and a half to two months. And we have seen surfactant dysfunctions coming in adolescents as well. It's yes. Also, it's not like we see surfactant means we have to, it has to present very early in life. In fact, I have a girl now who is coming at around uh, what, 15, 16 months. And then we have diagnosed her again a surfactant uh, dysfunction in her. So, and now she is around two and a half years. And she is off oxygen support. So... Okay. So we are seeing, you know, a lot of varied manifestations of surfactant dysfunction coming as early as newborn and as late as two and a half, three years also. And few of them I have seen, like not... Oh, Samir is asking how, how frequent. Yes, sir. Yes. What question, sir? Uh, no, how, frequent, how common is this uh, disorder in the population? So it is... Uh, uh, I may be biased. I understand that because Wadia being a referral center, we get a lot of referrals for such chronic uh, pulmonary conditions. But we, we may be diagnosing once in six months or so. So that is the our uh, maybe once in... Sometimes, you know, they come in clusters. So we see two, three cases together and there, there is a gap of another year or so. But till now, we are diagnosed almost 13 cases of surfactant uh, dysfunction. Of, large number. All are, proved, uh, all are proved genetically, all these 30 cases? You, so not 30, madam. 3, 0, 9, 1, 3, 1, 3. 1, 3. So all are proved genetically? Yes, madam. So genetic mutations have been done. And even we had uh, uh, lung biopsies and electron microscopies are also done. Yes, because that is what you have to differentiate between these allergic disorders. I mean, the message to be given that the children presenting at maybe a little one and a half to two years of age with wheeze like illnesses or a little hypoxia. So the differentiating point between late presenting children and the routine uh, hypoxic conditions would be better uh, till we diagnose genetically such conditions because these are these are very rare which present late. No, usually they present early. Yes. So some uh, minor forms are there, madam. With surfactant C a deficient dysfunction or they are like surfactant C um, have little relatively little better prognosis as compared to surfactant B. Surfactant A is Almost like they are born, uh, what do you call as a uh, dead babies or stillbirths or something like that. But B can present in neonatal and C can present from neonatal till adolescent age groups. Okay, And uh, C has little better prognosis as compared to B. And in fact, I have seen C responding better to your immunosuppression and uh, medications. So we have a girl now as we are talking about her. So she is doing really, even I am surprised to see a response in her with uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, 
uh, steroids so minimal dose of steroids and hydroxychloroquine she is pulling through she is off oxygen she is playing and all there is a minimal cyanotic tinge on the nails there is some component of clubbing that is uh, coming in but that is what i am seeing that she is pulling through so the prognosis definitely c has a better prognosis than b that's what i can say has a better prognosis than a b c a dr dijo the chief is a pulmonologist from kerala he is asking about what are the various presentations of these 13 cases 13 cases yeah so more all of them are presented mostly with uh, respiratory distress and uh, either whether it is a gradual progression or it whether it is a catastrophic presentation because of some superadded viral illnesses and now we had presented like uh, one case in uh, uh, this thing uh, where this child was a case of a post covid and uh, uh, post covid pulmonary alveolar proteinosis and uh, we had done a lung biopsy and this child was referred from ambezoga medical college and then this lung biopsy had come uh, positive for uh, they, they mentioned about the possibility of surfactant cannot be ruled out so when we sent this child's genetic mutation the child has turned out to be a uh, uh, mars uh, two mutation which is seen with uh, again a surfactant dysfunction so there was probably an underlying component the child was absolutely fine till 3 and 1/2 years developed covid and then there was a catastrophic presentation so uh, that's what so many times they present typically with uh, uh, exercise intolerance or maybe uh, uh, tachypnea maybe respiratory distress sometimes acutely presenting with some superadded viral illnesses okay. and uh, then commonly what we do is you know we don't send genetic mutations without doing lung biopsies we commonly uh, do lung biopsies first we document it and then then we send the genetic mutations to find out whether there is a correlation between the presentation the histopathology and the genetics okay. No, but that uh, is an excellent way actually that is an excellent way because sometimes we get some variants which are not explained and then we and some then it becomes very difficult for us to explain biopsy. to the so parents better. also ha huh? yes then it becomes very difficult for us to explain to the parents that yes, what mutation so, yes. is not and then, and yes so it is better that we go this way. way yeah so yeah. It, it the message should be the lung biopsy should be done before <laughs> genetic investigations because you may end up getting some ventilation syndrome uh, variant and then it is unexplainable so lung biopsy and this is excellent course yeah uh, we can so proceed to the next case, case now yes 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 next so this case is case number 2 and uh, this is a 4 year old a 4 year 11 months old child was completely fine till april 2019 Okay, and after that, this child has developed four admissions. Child has required four admissions, and this child was referred to Wadia from Mumbai only, Upper Hospital. Uh, very interesting case referred by Dr. Anupama Moskar, madam, the head there in Upper Hospital. So this child has uh, been admitted thrice there in April, July, and August 2019. That is a gap of almost one and uh, two and three months, uh, with complaints of fever and cough. and uh, radiologically there was an evidence of left lower zone pneumonia and this time in december 2019 the child was admitted to us uh, the child was admitted there and then transferred to us uh, for a complaint of right lower zone pneumonia so three episodes of left lower zone and one episode of right lower zone pneumonia in the year 2019 from april to december so a span of around 8 to 9 months each time the child has received iv antibiotics for 7 to 14 days and with a documented chest x ray clearing in between between two episodes the child was asymptomatic and there was nothing the child was otherwise going to school happy and playful at that time there was no school says but the child was actually playing and all so when he was transferred to us on admission the child was febrile the child was slightly tachypneic there was no clubbing or cyanosis and on auscultation the breath sounds were decreased on the right side with bronchial breathing and minimal crepitations and uh, the cbc was suggestive of hemoglobin of 11.7 wbc of 18900 and platelets were normal the crp was 112 and esr of 14 esr of 64 so any thought process here any anyone wants to comment here a child was completely normal till almost like 4 and 1/2 years after that four episodes of pneumonia documented episodes of pneumonia as lobar pneumonias 
three on the left side and one on the right side. Anyone want to comment here? Foreign body, you can think of like we changing foreign body from one side to other. Sequestered or something, sequestered lung piece or something, getting infected many times. Correct, correct. So we will discuss an approach here. Okay, so this child is a recurrent pneumonia. Now, can we label this child as a recurrent pneumonia? Absolutely, yes. So any child developing two or more episodes of pneumonia in lifetime is a case of recurrent pneumonia. Okay, so this is a child with recurrent pneumonia. Now we'll discuss what are the what are the approaches to recurrent pneumonia. So this was the first X-ray, as you can see. This is in April 2019, left lower zone pneumonia. Then in July 2019, again left lower zone pneumonia. Then again, this was in August 2019, left lower zone pneumonia. And then this was in almost like December 2019. This is 7 December 2019, and this time it was a, a right lower zone pneumonia. Okay, so three episodes of left lower zone and one episode of right lower zone. And you can see that the, when the child was admitted in December, the left lower zone was completely clear. Okay, so commonly when we see this was the CT when it was done in Cooper and then it was transferred to us, this was the CT that we can see. Okay, and it was showing a right lower zone consolidation. Okay, this can be seen. Okay. And then, how to approach a child with recurrent pneumonia? As I said, when we call it as a recurrent pneumonia, we need to see whether this recurrent pneumonia is involving one particular lobe or it is involving multiple lobes. So, how do we, what do you call it as? Whether it is a recurrent pneumonia with a unilobar pneumonia or a multilobar pneumonia. Okay. So, Unilobar pneumonia, commonly what we say is the most common in the foreign body. Okay, that particular lobe is affected, and then there is a uh, uh, superadded infection, mucus plugging, and all these things. So, foreign body is generally the presentation is unilobar pneumonia. Then, bronchial obstruction, it can be from very etiology, like a compression from outside, like a lymph node or a vessel, or it can be because of obstruction in the lumen, intraluminal obstruction. And that can be because of a mucus plug or that can be because of some uh, long-term damage to the bronchus, something like a bronchiectasis and again getting uh, occluded because of thick secretions. So bronchial obstruction, whatever may be the cause. And the sequestration, again, you need to keep in mind, sequestration is generally unilobar and not multilobar. Multilobar means you may have sequestration in multiple lobes, but one particular lobe will be commonly infected and that is a presentation where a sequestration can present as a recurrent pneumonia but commonly it is a unilobar recurrent pneumonia not multilobar pneumonia. Now what are the common presentation or what are the common causes for multilobar pneumonia? Multilobar pneumonia commonly we see aspiration, okay, sometimes we see upper lobes, sometimes we see lower lobes and all these things and then some systemic cause something like a cystic fibrosis, primary ciliary dyskinesia and then something something like a primary immunodeficiencies and commonly secondary immunodeficiency like an HIV. Okay, so investigation should be planned accordingly, whether it is a unilobar or whether it is a multilobar. When it is a unilobar, I mean, thinking of foreign body, absolutely the first investigation that should be done is a flexible bronchoscopy. If it is a bronchial obstruction because of something, then a CT or a bronchoscopy, the choice is yours because you may see that it may be an extraluminal compression then CT. And if you see that there is nothing extraluminal that is not seen on X-ray, then maybe you can go ahead with the bronchoscopy to see if there is something intraluminal obstruction. Sequestration again a CT with the angio aspiration, depending on the age group, PSTD and barium solo, you can do. And then depending on what is the secondary cause, if you are underlying CF or PCD or PID, genetics or sweat test or immunological workup can be packed and HIV ELISA can be. So this child, we put it as a recurrent pneumonia. And now because this, so if this child would have come to me in the first two pneumonias, I would have labeled this child as a unilobar pneumonia. Now this child has come to me in the fourth episode where three episodes are on the left side and one episode is on the right side. I have to call this as a multi-lobar pneumonia. Okay. Does the age, age matter in this case? Uh, absolutely, sir. The age matters because commonly we see now if this child would have been a case of an aspiration related pneumonia, why this child is not having aspiration till four and a half years and now? Okay, so age group is very important. We see aspiration related pneumonia, multi-lobar pneumonia typically in an infant. Okay, so less than one year. 
again we see commonly aspiration related to airway anomalies something like a to fistula or a cleft or a laryngomalacia related okay or tracheomalacia related aspirations these are commonly seen in, in a child who is less than 1 year so age group definitely matters here again foreign bodies are commonly seen beyond the age group of around you know 1 year to 5 years in between 1 year to 5 years or beyond 5 years also but commonly we don't see foreign body in less than 9 months or 1 year okay so age group definitely matters and you based on this age group as well as based on the affection of particular lobe your investigations will follow accordingly okay so this child so we thought maybe we are dealing with a child who has got some form of immunodeficiency now which immunodeficiency comes little late commonly immunodeficiency which comes little late is something what we can see is something which is related to b cell commonly we see is what we see is a uh, hypogamma globulinemia we see cvid is coming little late okay if this is severe immunodeficiency then they present very early but if it is a you know not very severe form so immunoglobulin related immunodeficiencies may come little late as well and something commonly presenting at that age group is cvid so for that immunological workup was done and it was normal hiv levels was normal sweat conductive was already been done and then was sent and that was normal that okay any any further clues here what should how should we process from here now any further investigations we should do or we just treat it this child as a pneumonia and send home bronchoscopy we should do bronchoscopy definitely i would love to do because i love doing bronchoscopies so here we did a bronchoscopy actually what i'll tell you this child was presented uh means we were not aware of the diagnosis in this child this child was kept as a case for a bronchoscopy workshop which we conducted in wadia with dr mahesh mohite okay so we we conducted a, i think that was a pedicon pre bronchoscopy workshop i don't remember exactly yeah 2019 in pedicon only then yeah yeah pedicon 2019 bronchoscopy workshop was done uh, in wadia and that time we presented this case even we were not of the uh, uh, aware of the diagnosis in this child this was child was referred Uh, because the child was absolutely from a poor family and they could not afford the cost of bronchoscopy of whatever 8000 10000 also so as a part of workshop we have decided we'll do free of cost bronchoscopy in this child okay. so this bronchoscopy was done free of cost in this child and this is uh, this is a bronchoscopy done later once we had diagnosed what was there so we found a foreign body in this child so this was it it was a broken oh. tire piece of a small uh, what do you call jeep or a car the play car rehta hai na chota wala yes, so yes. back side wala jo tire rehta hai whatever that broken uh, tire piece and there was a joke also during that workshop that because it was tire it was moving from one lobe to other so it was a case of a wandering foreign body from one lobe to other so we were right samir yes absolutely but never imagine like this one will come there ha <laughs> uh, so we were not i mean we, we, we yeah, didn't have a thought one. actually we did a bronchoscopy in this child to collect a ball and uh, you imagine this uh, you know the the happiness on everyone's face in a bronchoscopy workshop when we found a foreign body there so everybody was like ah so any any questions or we'll move to a short uh, presentation of how the foreign body is present and what should be done Yes, yes, you can. North, it has a, a sharp uh, edge also, right? The tire and uh, the spike that uh, bar is there. Yes. So usually these kind of foreign bodies should not wander from one place to other. They get stuck and then get a fibrosis or some uh, localized. Yeah, no, the, 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 the tire end of the uh, the foreign body was down and that sharp end was up. Okay, plus the sharp end. What we are saying is a plastic. So many times, you know. Uh, recently what we what i uh, two three days back we uh, uh, we did one foreign body removal in that child the child has uh, solid or led bulb and that led bulb has two uh, you know like uh, two prongs 
and one prong had gone inside the airway and how much we had we tried to pull it off it was not coming out so we had to literally push the foreign body inside and then pull it off so uh, yeah many times and uh, surprisingly there was not much of granulation tissue you know many times we have retained foreign body for so long almost like 8 months we expect uh, there should be some uh, granulation tissue around lot of inflammation around but probably because this foreign body was wandering from here to there that is the reason the child has not developed lot of granulation tissue and uh, typical uh, you know difficult extraction normally we if the foreign body is retained for a long time we see very difficult extraction with lot of bleeding and all so presentations of foreign body within 24 hours acute delay 24 hours so foreign bodies when we are learning they were classified as expected foreign body suspected foreign body and a non suspected foreign body so expected foreign body is like when there is an obvious history that the parents will come that the child was eating something and developed choking and that is we know that there is a obvious foreign body if we uh, do a scope that is an expected foreign body suspected foreign body is a child may present to with typical presentation of pneumonia and all and on a x ray or a radiological investigation you may found there is some metal ectasis or some hyperinflation or back uh, what do you call that uh, typical uh, uh, bronchus obstruction and ball wall phenomenon like that phenomenon and a non suspected foreign body where we do a uh, scopy for some other cause or something and then you find a foreign body so in this child practically he was falling into third category of a non suspected foreign body so nature of foreign body is organic and inorganic why need to discuss this because not seeds bone pieces being, being the most common causes lot of inflammation and as the foreign body absorbs the water from the mucosa it can progress from a partial obstruction causing an uh, what do you call hyperinflation to a complete obstruction causing atelectasis and inorganic foreign body like pen caps pins coils and with or can be found in the airways presentation depends on the level of obstruction so larynx they present typically with strider aphonia coughing choking in fact i'll tell you the my first foreign body removal was a foreign body in the larynx uh, and that was a very uh, because that time nobody was available and i was the only one available for removal of foreign body i don't know how i removed the foreign body it was way back 5 6 years back and that time this uh, the presentation was strider so and that foreign body was stuck in the larynx and um, literally i was going to refer this child to km that point of time by third ki i'll give one try and if it is not coming out and then i'll send the child to km that was the thing and then somehow we removed that one so larynx the foreign body will present with aphonia strider coughing choking and respiratory stress and sinusitis and tracheal foreign bodies again strider coughing and cardio respiratory arrest are common with tracheal foreign bodies then distal airways typically present with uh, late presentation like our child pneumonia and initial presentation like cough respiratory stress and sometimes bilateral mm-hmm. wheezing Bilateral. Investigations commonly what we do is chest X-ray, and it can show hyperinflation. If there is a partial obstruction, it can show atelectasis or Ehrlich syndrome. If there is a complete obstruction, and we commonly or sometimes we see radio opaque foreign bodies on a chest X-ray. So this is a typical X-ray of an obstructive hyperinflation where there is partial obstruction of the airway, and you can see the left side is completely hyperinflated. This is a case where a foreign body is completely obstructing the bronchus, and you can see an obstructive atelectasis on the right side. this is a late presentation where you can see that this child has already gone into a stage where there is a lot of complications are already developed there is bronchiectasis and um, you know it's a very late presentation and you can see the foreign body on a ct also sometimes you can see the foreign body is uh, obstructing the right main bronchus and we removed it it was a uh, chanada so complication that we see the foreign body is bronchitis spasm pneumonia that lactasis pneumothorax and sometimes with a large central airway obstructions deaths also and sometimes uh, one case i will tell you that we had seen a child who was presented to us with severe strider and, and before we could remove a foreign body the child had developed severe neurological damage so hypoxia related neurological damage so sometimes these are emergencies and you know there is no point in removing the foreign body is late because already the damage has already occurred <laughs> Yes, in this case, or we move on to a short case, very short case, and we'll finish in five ten minutes. Yes, sir. So, sir, shall I move to the next case? Five minutes only. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, this case, I'm just uh, 
showing you because i have learned from the case and i could use my knowledge from this case to the next case okay so this child is a 22 months old girl born of second degree consanguineous marriage second by birth order a child who has come to us for developmental delay abdominal distension since 6 months and increased work of breathing for last 2 to 3 months this child was referred to me because the child has developed respiratory distress since last week uh the child was this was the child at 12 months of age group as you can see the child was having a liver of 7 of 8 cm there was some hypertonia and brisk reflexes that were there at 12 months of age child's look and everything looks completely normal then this is the child as at 18 months you develop you see that the child has already started developing uh, uh, spasticity the child is already becoming hypertonic even though the child's sensorium and the child's uh, intent of the eyes will look normal okay five to six months later the child presented with severe respiratory distress and loss of all the remaining milestones this was the x-ray on presentation as you can see bilateral diffuse affection of the lungs it was reported as miliary tuberculosis this child was started on akt but something was not fitting because the child has presented with neurological manifestation so in fact i thought probably this is an aspiration pneumonia Okay, and I thought maybe this is a chronic aspiration over months. Okay, so this is the child has almost two years of age group. As you can see, the child has lost all the milestones, become absolutely uh, posturing and extensor posturing. The child has lost the eye contact and everything. And you can see the CT, CT showing bilateral diffuse affection. Initially, it was more of a uh, reticular nodular, but now the reticular nodular shadows are coalesced together and forming small areas of patchy consolidation in bilateral lung fields. So this child. i uh, kept a differential initially the child was kept as like a miliary tb and tbm but a tbm coming starting at 12 months and going to one year is very unlikely so tbm was not what i was thinking i was thinking more so of no con conversion sir so associated symptoms are not there no sir no neurological except uh, uh, loss of milestones and then the child has started developing this hypertonia and uh, you know the child was losing on the sensorium also over a period of time liver was there yes sir 6 7 cm liver and a huge spleen also so storage this one hiv was negative or yeah hiv was negative ma'am this was the x ray which we have to think any 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 thought process storage like mmp cool yes absolutely so here we did a bone marrow in this child which was showing uh, typical neumon pick cells and then bal also was showing some storage so i was thinking of more of a foamy macrophages maybe some storage cells if the bal was done to exclude tuberculosis in the shell tuberculosis cultures and everything but this is a bal slide which is showing a storage cell i was not sure what it is but probably it was a storage cell then we did a, a clinical exam in the shell the bone marrow was suggestive of storage disorder possibly of a neumon pick that was uh, diagnosed and then uh, again a uh, genetic study was done again it was picked up as a neumon pick why i am showing you this case here is because similar child was referred again and this child who had again a respiratory distress huge abdominal distension massive hypertrophemegaly again a chest x-ray was showing diffuse lung affection and again this child was diagnosed as neumon pick on bone marrow as well as on a uh, genetic study and this child underwent a bone marrow transplant and a narayan arudhyalaya and after that this is the immediate post transplant and now this child is 3 years and almost living a normal life a child with a storage disorder with respiratory involvement diagnosed as neumon pick undergoing a bone marrow transplant this child donor had come from switzerland and the entire expenses and all were mobilized through crowd funding and uh, now this child is 3 years and almost there is no liver spleen no oxygen requirement and living a normal life any questions on this case or previous cases uh, no question but suggestion that nowadays we don't do bone marrow biopsy in neumon pick or any storage disorders either we do enzyme or direct mutations and that is for free so freely it is available by the uh, companies uh, giving enzyme therapy so any child suspected of storage disorder they provide a filter paper where you have to send with blood drop and you don't you don't have to do invasive biopsies uh, because in previous case also uh, somebody has commented that if interstitial lung disease sometimes we don't do lung biopsies so wherever you suspect directly storage disorder we don't we directly do enzymes or mutations which is which is nowadays for free for storage disorders 
so that everybody uh, can you know uh, do uh, at periphery also yeah in second case you do bronchoscopy first and then do cystic fibrosis checkup which one sir the second case no sir this time Why? sir one of the first bronchoscopy is more indicated in recurrent and bilateral pneumonia shifting pneumonias yes, and sir. was the foreign body ready open no sir that was a plastic foreign body So why not do bronchoscopy instead of doing cystic fibrosis checkup and all those things? The first. Sir, actually, this child has come to me. My child is in distress. My child is in distress. I think bronchoscopy should be first investigation to be done. Understood, sir. Understood, definitely. Sir, so the conclusion faster actually. Yes, sir. So, so this child has come to me with the fourth pneumonia. Not uh, so priorly only. So this child has come to me only for the sir scopy, not for other further investigations or prior investigations. Actually, this child has come for workshop. Uh, for doing a free so workshop admission yeah a workshop admission usually in private practice one will go for a bronchoscopy first and then followed by cystic fibrosis you know in such cases you know? so perhaps so, uh, uh, common general pediatrician we want to know the uh, one two three four indications of bronchoscopy <laughs> uh sir it depends on the age group of the child but commonly what 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 we do bronchoscopy is for mainly you know one one thing i would like to uh, put it across to all the pediatricians here is uh, can you stop 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 share stop share so, so what i want to put across to all the pediatricians here sir uh the bronchoscopy that we do commonly depends what the common indications depends on the age group so commonly we do in children who are less than 6 months for mainly the strider okay, or some congenital airway malformations presenting to us like choking episodes during feeding or presenting to us with strider not resolving or presenting to us with some aspiration pneumonias bronchoalveolar lavage collection is one indication that is Uh, what we do bronchoscopy for for all the age groups in fact for neonates also and till I mean, even post transplants and all also everywhere we do bronchoalveolar lavage so that is one indication that remains uh, one of the common indication for bronchoscopy for across all age groups but depending on the age group like strider airway malformations come in less than one year of age group and beyond one year of age group uh, we commonly do bronchoscopies for children who are having bronchiectasis who are having uh something like foreign bodies uh, suspected foreign bodies so and uh, many times so we uh, so bronchoscopy we we feel that always a bro- doing a bronchoscopy we should have some positive uh, finding in that i would like to put across to all the pediatrician a negative bronchoscopy also helps you uh, uh, you know typically in a managing a case because we have seen the airways from inside what is happening inside is seen and once we see that the airways are completely clean then we be many times we try and focus on some other differential diagnosis okay so that is one thing another thing is i want to put it across here all pediatricians is uh, many times we label this children of uh, you know neonatal or infantile age group as laryngomalacias without uh, doing uh, scopies and all okay i am not saying you should do scopies in all the patients uh, to prove the diagnosis of laryngomalacia i know that i know laryngomalacia is the most common cause for strider but at least we can put it as strider under evaluation and if the strider is not settling with the age if there are associated feeding issues if there are associated failure to thrive then definitely we should uh, you know uh, do the ch- uh, post the child for bronchoscopy but definitely we should write on paper strider under evaluation rather than directly writing it as a laryngomalacia because laryngomalacia is basically a, a, a scopy finding in any questions further One so the in the question. first case uh, you mentioned about that you suspected some sticky material so at that time we were not knowing the diagnosis would you have done the bronchoalveolar lavage that time which case the first in the one. first case neonatal the case small neonatal. yeah yeah like so you say bronchoscopy can be done at any time we had done bronchoscopy in that child sir and bronchoscopy was normal and there were nothing in the bronchoalveolar collection the bronchoalveolar lavage also was okay. negative and other second question is in the second case i wondering foreign body so generally at what time we should do the bronchoscopy because we waited here four times in the four months like suppose we should we do it at the second step only when you got well somebody got it at the second time the same place persistent of the pneumonia mm-hmm. so why we that time only we should have done the bronchoscopy 
ideally absolutely sir second episode is a recurrent pneumonia and when there is an obviously no cause yeah we should go ahead and do but uh, i'll tell you sir one more child was referred by dr anupama madam a similar presentation uh, of multilobar pneumonia and that child turned out to be a cvid means uh, that child uh, i did a bronchoscopy first bronchoscopy was normal then we did a immunological workup and immunological workup we found that the child is uh, you know immunodeficient but what i will tell you that typical lobar pneumonia jo milta hai na with a foreign body that will not be seen with immunodeficiency here the uh, you know the, re- the restriction of that pathology to one particular lobe will not be typically restricted in an immunodeficient child many times you know it is one lobe and adjacent lobe something of that sort or that particular lobe is also not completely involved so you know uh, you know thoda patchy patch involvement is more common in an immunodeficient child as yeah. compared to a foreign body child where a typical one lobe affection one lobe affection one question was there from our um, doctor amit saxena whether inner corticosteroids will be useful in cases of surfactant b deficiency topical steroids uh, in an inner corticosteroids milder variant i mean uh, no no not really sir not really. in fact this role of oral steroids also is not very well documented in other uh, surfactant deficiencies except surfactant c which is a milder form of this thing where uh, there are few trials which have found uh, steroids a combination of steroids and hydroxychloroquine has a better result in only and only surfactants c type but mm-hmm. that too us uh, up to certain age groups because this over a period of time this is going to go down in any other questions from audience so we have a wonderful audience here with all pharmacology from kerala noy mumbai dr sagar is also there dr jiju joseph is also there dr venkatesh rao welcome sir he is from hyderabad and i think uh, i request sir to say few words all pharmacology sir here to i think guide us thank you thank you for attending yes mr rao sir uh, can you say few words sir is around dr yashwant rao sir i think jijo sir dr jijo dr sagar sagar varangar yeah. hello ha yeah yeah sagar is there yeah a uh, wonderful talk by parmarth my friend and uh, so i just wanted to congratulate him very nice very nice leader thank you thanks thanks i think we have covered all questions sir dr mangai to offer a formal vote of thanks thank you sir um today's webinar was indeed interesting cases in pediatric pulmonology as our expert for today dr parmat uh, chandrani he unfolded each case it was as if a mystery being solved slowly really a feast to our gray cells and i must say uh, thank you dr parmat for uh, your calm rendition of each and every case and then later on not only reaching the diagnosis but also discussing the differential diagnosis of each case and discussing the case in short for all of us to understand it better and uh, even when we face with such a case immediately the dds that you have mentioned will come to our mind so thank you so much sir for being with us and uh, discussing these cases uh, with us thank you for being with us here uh, i would also like to thank our moderator uh, dr satish sahane today for taking us uh, through these uh, through the entire webinar and smoothly conducting today's webinar thank you dr satish sir thanks thanks uh, it is also navi mumbai ilp's honor to have uh, doctors from all over india from hyderabad from kerala and all for our webinars i would especially like to thank dr yashwant rao dr jizo uh, jizo joseph dr ratna lalwani dr venkatesh damkonkar dr sagar varankar for their presence here thank you so much for gracing uh, our webinar today uh thanks to dr snehal our own dr snehal for your valuable inputs uh, and thank you dr jitendra gavane sir for arranging such a wonderful um webinars and being our guiding force 
Undoubtedly, Navi Mumbai IIP teams, which keeps working, Dr. Vikram Patra, Dr. Cyril, Dr. Mahendra, all of them who help and support us in conducting the webinars. Thank you, team Navi Mumbai IIP. And thank you to all the delegates for being with us today, encouraging us and continuing this learning process with Navi Mumbai IIP. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Parmarth. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, Sathya, sir. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, sir.